Hello, everyone. I'm your host, Ryan Murray, and I'm excited for us to be back for another session of our Advanced Air Mobility webinar series. Today, we'll update you on our near-term advanced air mobility activities, the proposed special federal aviation regulation for powered lift aircraft, and the research partnership between the FAA and the Air Force for testing emerging advanced air mobility technology. If you have any questions, please submit them using the YouTube live chat button at the bottom of your screen, and we will have some time to answer questions towards the end of today's webinar. Paul Fontaine, Assistant Administrator for NextGen, will get us started. The FAA has designated the Office of NextGen to serve as the focal point on advanced air mobility issues, to provide programmatic support, and to coordinate key projects across the many parts of the FAA that will be required to integrate the new technology into our airspace system. Welcome, Paul. The floor is now yours. All right. Thank you very much, Ryan, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode in our AAM webinar series. Um, we really hope that you're finding these uh, useful. Um, we're always looking for new ways to kind of communicate uh, our information to this broad community, and we know that there's a lot of interest uh, on this topic. Um, so we're always looking for your feedback, um, you know, all through this process, and uh, please let us know if there's uh, issues and topics you would like us to cover. So as we begin to move forward with implementing AAM, I think we realize that there are a lot of uh, crucial interactions with AAM stakeholders, um, which will be key to sort of shaping our standards and our strategies for how we're going to introduce this new form of aviation nationwide. Um, this collaboration and really joining with uh, stakeholders um, and along with the FAA's thoughts are helping us pave that way for the future of aviation in our country. Um, just a reminder, of course, you know, safety drives the process and the timelines for certification and for integration. And there are a lot of things to consider the aircraft themselves, how they'll operate and perform, the operational framework of how we'll introduce the introduction, uh, pilot, pilot qualifications, training, and many more topics, along with all of the pieces for the ecosystem. All of these will have to come together, and we're going to have to work through all of this to make sure that we integrate these. Uh, new operations into the system, you know, very safely. Um, you know, on many occasions, we may provide interim guidance, right, um, which will be really um, needed for how we jumpstart our initial operations. But as more data becomes available and the marketplace matures, um, we're going to continue to work with the community to refine our you know, appropriate policies and standards uh, to address really the, the really large, uh, broad variety of operations that we see happening in this future AAM ecosystem. So today's webinar is going to include an update, as Ryan said, about the proposed um, special federal aviation regulations known as the SFAR for powered lift, um, the FAA's, and also the FAA's research partnership that we have just done with the Air Force. Um, but first, we'd like to talk about how the FAA has really structured itself to address um, these AAM opportunities. Um, and this is really focused on our near-term implementation plan. Uh, for, so, for those of you that have uh, been out there looking, our Innovate 28 project is really focused on how we're going to establish this operational AAM ecosystem um, at one or more key sites in the near term. And this really will become our basis, basically, for how we're going to do wider nationwide deployment. So to that end, the FAA has formed what we call innovation teams, um, I-teams for short, um, which is really composed of staff. Um, from every line of business inside the FAA, all hands on deck. Um, every, every organization that will have a role in facilitating advanced air mobility development. Um, and that team is really focused on um, constantly um, working to identify you know, the challenges and working solutions for how we're going to integrate AAM into the national airspace. So our I teams developed uh, the implementation plan that is available out there on the web and was published this past summer. Um, we will continue to update that as we get more information and as uh, it becomes, uh, as the use cases and everything become a little more into focus, um, we consider this to be a living document that we'll continue to, um, you know, um, update as we learn more and we grow into this new space. So with now, I'm going to really turn this over to uh, Mitchell Bernstein, who is helping lead the Innovate 28 programs and a lot of the coordination that occurs across the building on the FAA side. And he's going to provide a uh, you know, more details on some of the more recent activities since this has been published. Uh, Mitchell is one of our key program managers here at the NextGen office. Um, he's overseeing a lot of uh, developmental activities, um, and we're really putting that expertise to use here as we, uh, you know, dive into uh, 
enabling advanced air mobility. So with that, I'm going to say, take it away, Mitchell. All right. Thank you, Paul. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Excited to have this opportunity to talk to you all about advanced air mobility uh, and the, the great work that we're doing at the FAA and with all of our uh, various stakeholders. My job, really, like Paul said, I'm uh, also in NextGen, and that means uh, I'm tasked with uh, being one of the, our integrators, uh, both within our building, working with the other uh, great um, sub subject matter experts across the FAA, and also working with our stakeholders outside the building as well. So we're working with industry and um, other agencies. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about those partnerships and how we've structured our team with the I teams, like Paul mentioned. Uh, and then I'll share kind of a, a bit of a dive into our um, into our work plan and all the activities that we're expecting uh, to be needed to implement AM in the near term, and then kind of introduce um, uh, you know the the path to uh, the midterm and more mature state as well. So for those of you that are not uh, familiar with AAM or wondering what type of uh, aircraft we're talking about, um, really what we're talking about primarily are what we are calling electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft or eVTOLs. Uh, and these are futuristic looking aircraft, but they're actually just around the corner from reality here um, with many uh, uh, pretty far through development already. Uh, and through the certification process, working uh, through aircraft certification and operational certification as well. And we're expecting them to be FAA certified or having decisions about certification as soon as 2025. So there's a, a number of different exciting companies out there um, that have uh, you know, somewhat different designs. Uh, they're all pretty unique in their own way. But some of the general characteristics that we're seeing, obviously the main one, uh, like the name says, they have the ability to take off and land vertically um, and also transition to uh, fixed wing, uh, fixed wing uh, flight as well, like a traditional aircraft. So there's kind of some uh, characteristics like a helicopter and some like a traditional aircraft. And obviously, uh, like the name says, electric power uh, is a big um, is a big important piece of these as they are uh, primarily powered with batteries. We're also looking at hydrogen power, but for now, um, the the primary uh, focus has been EV tolls. So um, this is expected to start small. You know, there's going to be uh, just a few aircraft come online when certification is achieved, um, but we're expecting that to quickly grow and even be a, possibly a $30 billion market by 20, uh, 2030. Um, so I think the uh, layman term that people often use for these aircraft, if you've heard of air taxis, that's the, this type of aircraft. Uh, but that's really only one potential use case. We're also uh, expecting cargo use cases, and even medical transport and, and things like um, regional air mobility as well, going from farther out to the city. So uh, initial air uh, operations might be in general aviation type areas and uh, uncontrolled airspace, but we are expecting this to be um, in urban areas as well and metropolitan areas. So um, pretty exciting use cases here, whether it's you know medical transport, cargo transport, or even something like landing at a ma major airport uh, and quickly flying over to um, you know, a, a major city. That's what we're expecting and, and really trying to prepare for now in the FAA. I think our uh, job is exciting and challenging because we're building an ecosystem, not just for you know, the initial operations, but also as these start to scale and we see you know, large numbers of these aircraft and also as uh, the use cases get more and more complex. So um, we want to make sure that we have a, a repeatable process in place for implementation and that, you know, as we get to scale, things are done safely and, and obviously efficiently as well. So um, a whole lot of challenges. And I'll, I'll talk about, um, you know, the, the, all the work ahead and really the great work that's even been done to date. Plenty has been done already. Um, so we'll share some of that and talk about the different infrastructure that we're expecting to be needed. So a bit about our team, Paul mentioned the I-teams. That's really our uh, attempt at making sure that this is a structured approach where we have experts from all across the agency because uh, there's a, a whole number of organizations within the FAA. It's a large team, um, but we have great representation that's really energized from uh, all across these different topics from certification. Uh, we heard about vertiports at the last webinar. If you uh, missed that one, it's available on YouTube as well. If you go to the FAA website, um, under the air taxi page, but 
Um, Vertiports is a big piece, and then we're we're obviously um, very uh, interested in safety and and people, but um, even more specifically, community engagement. You know, we want to make sure that um, you know the people in the communities that where these aircraft are going to be flying are uh, aware that the changes are coming um, and understanding what that means uh, in their community, and and really also understand the benefits. So uh, a lot of these aircraft are are much quieter since they're electric uh, powered. So. Um, you know, understanding what are the what are the good changes that are coming, uh, and what are the exciting opportunities that come uh, with EV tolls and uh, advanced air mobility. So this team is in place, and this has allowed us to uh, develop uh, the implementation plan that Paul mentioned, and that really is the roadmap and trying to understand from A to Z what are all the uh, activities that need to. Uh, take place and and um, you know documentation that needs to de be developed. What are the policy changes that need to happen um, on the aircraft side, grant ground side, air side, um, all across the board? What kind of uh, you know what kind of infrastructure needs to be in place to enable this change and make sure that it's done safely and properly? Um, so that that implementation plan is available, um, and you know it, it's it's a pretty complex document, but it, it does uh, I think have a comprehensive look at all the activities that we're expecting. Uh, and that will be, you know, tailored um, from site to site as we, you know, continue to learn and, and grow with this industry. Um, and so excited to talk to you today a little bit more in depth about uh, what went into that implementation plan and how we're, you know, focusing on issues as they arise and, and tackling them properly. So of course it starts with safety. Uh, we do have this uh, safety focused approach and that means a, a whole of government approach for us. So, um, you know, the, the FAA is, is largely uh, in charge of, you know, making sure that airspace changes are needed and, and things at airports, but it even goes uh, beyond that, right? So we're working with um, other agencies across in, in both the federal and state level uh, and making sure that we integrate this new exciting type of aircraft uh, into, you know, what we're expecting to be uh, into areas that are potentially already constrained. So how do we do that without impacting operations uh, that are already going on? Um, and also, you know, uh, in the future, we're expecting these aircraft to be operating autonomously. Um, so at first, uh, we're, we're expecting piloted operations uh, and then, you know, uh, quickly moving uh, to the autonomous state down the road. Um, so obviously that that takes a lot of work. Uh, so that's why we have those uh, various I teams already uh, starting to think about those challenging type of uh, concepts like autonomous flight. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more later uh, about what goes into, um, you know, the mature state. So our, our regulatory framework, obviously, with a new type of aircraft and a, will be a new type of uh, a new class of flight that uh, John Posey will talk about in a few minutes. Uh, we need to update our uh, regulatory framework to make sure that um, you know everything is uh, you know safe and and legal and allowed. So um, you know we're taking these non-traditional aircraft, but really trying to leverage what is already out there. So there, you know, uh, like I mentioned, there's some. Uh, aspects of these aircraft that are similar to existing aircraft. Um, so it's really making sure that, uh, you know, we take advantage of what's already there, but, you know, make sure we're prepared for uh, the new changes as well. And the way we're accomplishing all this is through our Innovate 28 program. So um, for those of you that have already heard about Innovate 2028, uh, I think we often get hung up on the number 2028 and say, well, what about the uh, operations that are going to happen earlier? Yes, we're we're very interested in helping uh, enable AAM in the near term. Once those aircraft are type certified and operationally certified, we our job in the FAA is to make sure that all the other work is completed um, and all the infrastructure and changes are in place so that we can start uh, flying these aircraft right away. So for initial entry into service uh, flights, that might be as soon as you know, 25, 26, 27 timeframe, um, the Innovate 28 program wants to make sure, make sure that those are, are happening as well. So um, we're working with all our different stakeholders and closely with industry partners to understand what their use cases look like, where they're trying to fly uh, and help you know, support those activities and really make sure that you know, whatever location um, industry is interested in, in uh, you know, integrating these, this, these types of operations that we're there to help and, and make sure it's done um, you know, uh, appropriately. 
We're also uh, interested, I already mentioned the more mature state of AAM and, uh, you know, even urban air mobility, where we, we look at autonomous flight and things like that, where we're at a much larger scale of these aircraft beyond 2028. Um, so, you know, the our, pro our program is already in place, the team is already in place, and we have this programmatic portfolio approach that should be able to help us uh, towards that as well. But really what I wanted to talk uh, primarily about uh, today is the near term and initial operations and what it's going to take to get there for initial entry into service. And I mentioned uh, other agencies. So uh, the Department of Transportation um, has already been leading uh, our, our AAM interagency working group, where we have a number of different uh, agencies uh, working on a national strategy for AAM. So um, looking at things like security, power and energy, infrastructure, community impacts, spectrum, spectrum and supply chain. Uh, so really, those are big national issues that go beyond just, uh, you know, aviation go just and beyond, um, you know, the airspace. So things like how do we upgrade the electrical grid? Um, how do we deal with security, uh, cyber security, physical security? Um, what does security screening like look like for these new aircraft? Because uh, many of them are, you know, four person, uh, four passenger aircraft, um, you know, doing flights that are about 15 to 20 minutes in many cases. What does security look like that? So there was a request for information published in the Federal Register that closed uh, for comment back in August, but we received a lot of really good feedback, um, tell, you know, sharing uh, opinions on um, what the government should as a whole should be looking at for uh, making sure that AEM uh, is, is uh, you know, um, researched properly. So some recent uh, significant activities, I mentioned a lot of work is uh, has been underway. That's been true for this area for really a number of years, actually, but some uh, things that we've accomplished just in the last few months. Um, the Urban Air Mobility Concept of Operations for UAM, uh, that was published back in May, and that really looks kind of at a technical look uh, at the at the future of urban air mobility, and um, that's a concept of, of operations document. And that kind of fed jumping to the third one there, our AAM implementation plan, which, um, you know, is looking more at the near term um, kind of, uh, you know, programmatic approach that I mentioned. So those two go hand in hand with UAM kind of being our guiding light for the future of, of uh, these operations with AAM uh, implementation plan being our uh, near term focus, more of a tactical approach. Uh, and June of, on June 14th uh, this year, we had the powered lift uh, NPRM, the Notice of Proposed rule, Rulemaking published, and uh, John Posey's here from Flight Standards to talk uh, more about that. Um, back in August, we had a, a great summit with uh, industry and many of the other uh, external stakeholders where we talked uh, all about AAM and um, shared more information on the implementation plan and uh, really just coalesced as an industry as a whole to uh, see, you know, what everybody's been working on and um, see the various uh, areas where we should really be pouring our resources. Uh, I already mentioned the RFI for uh, the AAM Interagency Working Group. Uh, and then back uh, on October 25th, we uh, established a really exciting uh, partnership with AFWORKS uh, Agility Prime uh, with the Air Force. Um, so they're, you know, they're, they're already doing a ton of great work doing flight testing to understand the performance of these aircraft. Um, and so, you know, the FAA also has a lot of uh, policy needs where um, we need to understand the performance of the aircraft in order to, to develop that policy. Uh, so we have now a, a MOU, a memorandum, memorandum of understanding, kind of establishing that partnership. And uh, Paula Naragas is going to talk about that uh, today. And then just a, a couple weeks ago, we just um, kicked off also our autonomy working group. So although you know my job and a lot of what we're focusing on um, in the agency right now is, is day one of operations and trying to you know scale to a, a 2028 type environment where we're somewhat at scale. Again, we want to keep our eye on the long term as well. Uh, and so this working group is already kicked off to you know take a take a look at autonomy and some of the challenges there. Uh, and coming up soon, so we have, um, this is just the second of our series of webinars, and the next one is uh, going to be all about autonomy. So um, we'll have a, a great group of uh, brilliant individuals to talk about uh, what the great work we've been doing on autonomy and also uh, what the work ahead there will be, kind of the road to uh, the future, and that'll be in January. 
Um, and then the, uh, the, the webinar that's planned for after that in March is going to be on um, airspace integration impact assessments using, using modeling and simulation. So this is really modeling, um, you know, the operations today at some of our uh, expected AAM locations and um, making sure that, you know, injecting AAM in, uh, operations is not going to disrupt uh, conventional operations and making sure that everything's uh, smooth integration. Uh, and then uh, in 2024, we're uh, expecting the national strategy report from the interagency working group to be published. So I've mentioned a lot of our stakeholders already, but really this is kind of the key to us. There's so much great work going on with advanced air mobility and um, uh, EV tolls and, and all the, the you know exciting work we've already kind of mentioned, but um, you know we want to make sure that uh, within our stakeholder team here, which is clearly a, a diverse group, since this is really just a, a few of the many, many um, stakeholders we're, we're already collaborating and communicating with. Um, but we want to make sure that everybody's vision is heard and that we're, you know, following through to, to support industry's vision. So starting on the right there, you see, you know, a lot of the individual companies. So you have uh, aircraft uh, manufacturer companies, or as we call them, the OEM, the original equipment uh, uh, manufacturers. We have aircraft operators, uh, vertiport developers as well. So under, you know, trying to uh, figure out what the future of um, AAM infrastructure is going to look like on the ground. And then we're also working with some uh, industry groups like Gamma and NBAA to understand the industry perspective as a whole, because every company's got their own business model and perspective. So really working with all these groups to understand, you know, what does your use case look like? Where are you trying to fly? And how can we help uh, as the FAA to uh, bring you to those goals? Then looking in the middle there, um, obviously, you know, we're, we're doing so much work uh, on the federal level, but also, you know, working with the local communities and, and local stakeholders is so important. So we have um, State Department of Transportation groups, we have airport authorities, um, you know, even talking with uh, the Olympic Committee in, in uh, LA to see if there's ways to support the Olympics with uh, air, advanced air mobility, um, and really just trying to work with local, state, uh, territorial, and tribal governments to understand, you know, what are their different equities? How do we, you know, introduce AAM as an industry in ways that work for local communities? We want to make sure this is something that uh, helps all, all everybody on, you know, and all across the country. So. Um, you know, it's exciting to hear the different perspectives on the state and local level as well. And then I already mentioned on the left side there, uh, some of our uh, federal agencies, but, um, you know, through the interagency working group, we're, you know, working with, I believe, about 20 agencies at this point, uh, and obviously our partnership with uh, Agility Prime and also with NASA for the for uh, understanding aircraft performance is a huge piece as well. So um, a, a lot of exciting work and and clearly, um, you know, it's uh, a lot to get our arms around and make sure uh, everybody's moving in the right direction. But um, for, for me, it's been a, a great opportunity so far just to understand um, all the uh, different, uh, different um, equities and um, goals and visions for all these different stakeholders. So moving a bit into our Innovate 28 program. So this is kind of a glimpse into the uh, implementation plan that we've already mentioned a couple of times. So um, really each of these uh, items here is kind of a, a high level look, believe it or not, into you know, the, the work that needs to be done to enable AAM operations at you know, one or more key sites in the near, in the near term. Um, so not all of this will be needed at every single site. I think that's a, a key message here is that you know, this will all be site specific, but really what we tried to do with the implementation plan is take a comprehensive look at all of the different work that might be needed. Um, so kind of at a, you know, potential greenfield site with a new aircraft manufacturer, new operator, um, you know, what's the different level of, levels of work that might need to go in. So we have things on uh, the national level with policy development for air traffic and vertiports. We have um, certification activities, which is, you know, uh, aircraft certification, operational certification, um, wake separation requirements. So obviously with this being a new type of aircraft, we have to understand how does uh, the wake of these aircraft impact other aircraft and how does the wake uh, turbulence of other aircraft impact the, the flight of these aircraft. So, um, you know, a lot of exciting work going on there. Um, I already mentioned security, but, you know, this is kind of, I, I don't want to go through all these items today, but um, really, the takeaway is each of these bullets has probably, uh, you know, a number of other 
uh, sub items that need to be completed as well. So um, these are not just FAA items. These are things that industry needs to complete or work on. Um, other federal government agencies will be working on, obviously, the, the local and state uh, governments as well, and, and many other stakeholders, right? So um, really what we're planning to do as we kind of identify key sites uh, and we work with industry to understand what do their use cases look like, we're going to you know define what does that vision look like and then really try to take this vision um, and uh, or this, uh, this plan and um, make it site specific, use case specific, uh, and and try to tailor it for each individual site. So we'll get all of these stakeholders together, make sure everybody understands and, and uh, agrees on what that vision looks like, and then um, develop the process. So moving more into kind of a, a process uh, type view here, so similar work to what you saw on the last slide, um, but really the the I think the main takeaway here is if you look to the right, and you see these certification triangles here, those big milestones that everybody's uh, rightfully concerned about and excited about, which is, you know, the aircraft is, is certified now and the operator is certified and allowed to fly. Um, that's all great. But look at all this other work that needs to be completed, right? So um, what we want to make sure is that everything's starting now and happening in parallel so that when that certification milestone is hit, um, everything else is all in place and we're ready to go. So this this process is going to take, you know, all the stakeholders involved at a key site working together, um, you know, as problems arise, making sure that uh, they're taken from a, a group and collaborative perspective um, and make sure that really everything is is moving along uh, and on track. So what we don't want is to get get close to the finish line and then you know, something else arises that we hadn't planned for. So there, there'll always be unknowns, but really what we tried to do with our implementation plan is identify all those all those unknowns up front and, and start, you know, answering the diff difficult questions and undertaking the difficult work. Um, and the good news is a lot of this is already under, underway. I mentioned some of the manufacturers are already, uh, you know, well through the uh, certification process. A lot of this development is, is already being, um, you know, completed. And, you know, right now we're just trying to understand the details and, and work through those with our industry partners. So I've mostly been talking about the near term and, and what it takes to get to, you know, the initial operations. Uh, and, and that's obviously a, lot, a large amount of work and it's um, already moving along. But we want to keep our eye on the midterm and mature, mature stage as well. So for the midterm, you know, that means, you know, maybe for the near term first operations, we could leverage a lot of existing infrastructure, maybe changes are minimal. Uh, obviously, it's going to depend on the site, depend on the operator, depend on the use case. Um, but, you know, as we start to scale, maybe larger changes are needed to policy and infrastructure. Uh, some new standards for communications, navigation and surveillance equipment might be needed. Um, and then moving towards the mature state as we look at autonomous operations and a true scale where we're, we're expecting a you know huge change to the aviation system. Um, and you know that's going to require even more policy changes and um, technology changes. So um, that's why we're starting the autonomy work group and um, that you know segues to the next webinar um, where we'll we'll be um, sharing all the good work that um, is already taking place and will be taking place. Uh, to get to that road towards towards autonomy. Uh, so thank you very much for listening about our AAM overview. Hopefully that gave everybody a bit of a glimpse into the work that we're uh, looking into, all the different concepts that we're exploring and uh, technologies that um, are under development and uh, you know nearing completion. And we're excited to to see fly in the real world soon. Um, hopefully you understand now the the ecosystem that we're building out and. Uh, you know, the team and programmatic approach that we're taking to make sure that industry's vision is is uh, realized, right? We want to make sure um, that this is done safely and efficiently. So um, excited to, to see this uh, move along. And um, with that, I'm going to introduce now uh, from our flight standard service, uh, Mr. John Posey, who is uh, the AM integration lead. Take it away, John. Appreciate it, Mitchell. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of you for joining us here today. I um, want to talk to you a little bit about the, the Power Lift SFAR. We're going to talk a little bit about what an SFAR is and how the process is working and where we're at with that process. Um, early in, in Mitchell's presentation, you heard him make a comment about uh, updating our regulatory framework. 
uh, to support power lift and integration of power lift into our national airspace. And, and the, the power lift SFAR that we're talking about here is, is absolutely a cornerstone to that effort. But it's not the only effort that we've had. Over the last uh, two years, we've had numerous rulemaking activities. Uh, we, we've made some changes to our Aaron certification standards, our practical test standards for, for pilots. We've updated some recognition for military pilots to bring their PIC time uh, over to the FAA in the civilian world. And we updated our air carrier definitions. So these were all very critical to some of the, the things that we're trying to do to, to lay this groundwork to move power to lift um, into our national airspace. Now, let's talk a little bit about the, the power to lift as far. Uh, as you can see on the slide here, we did publish a notice for proposed rulemaking uh, back in June of 2023, as Mitchell mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, and it absolutely does, does complement those other rulemaking activities. Uh, the publication came out in June. It closed in, I believe it was August 14th. We received hundreds of comments, both from aviation organizations and organizations outside of aviation. So we're extremely grateful to the American public and, uh, and quite frankly, outside of the United States for providing those comments. Uh, we're going through the processes right now of going through all these comments and working to move that, that SFAR on through our system. So let's take just a minute and talk about SFAR. We've used that term a couple of times now. So uh, a special federal aviation regulation or an SFAR is a tool that the agency has to give us the ability to implement something like powered lift um, prior to making permanent rulemaking or, or going into permanent rules. And when we do that, when we have a situation where we're still gathering data, but we need to, we need to bring something into our system. And power lift is, is a wonderful example of that, that the, the SFAR allows to, to bring this online and integrate this into our national airspace and then spend time gathering additional information uh, with things that, that were mentioned a little bit earlier, like uh, remote pilot systems and autonomous systems that are moving forward. So utilizing that SFAR absolutely gives us the ability to, to gather that information and do permanent rulemaking at a later time. So the, the SFAR, um, right now we're in the process of looking at those comments and we're working that through the agency now as a high priority effort. We have a large team of, of inspectors over here in the flight standards organization, working with our legal department to start to move that, th um, that particular piece of rulemaking through our system. Now, it doesn't mean that um, while we're waiting on all that to occur, that we don't have other things happening. As you can see from the um, second bullet from the bottom there, we're, we're working now with the OEMs uh, on aircraft certifications. We have submissions and, and applications that have come into us for, for their particular makes and models and what it is that they're proposing to bring into the airspace. So we're working extensively with them right now to, to type certificate their aircraft. Uh, we have other policy development that's in works right now to make sure that we have all the underlying and fundamental uh, work done when it's time to implement this into our system and operational certification, you know, how these aircraft are going to be operated out there in the national airspace, uh, most likely as air taxis under our part 135 system out there where air taxis today operate. Um, our intent, as you can see from that last bullet, it, is to have all of this done, the regulatory elements in place, the policy efforts in place all in time for the entry into service timeframes that are being looked at by industry right now to, to bring all their efforts um, to the American public. And Mitchell, that was all I had. So I'm going to introduce Paula Norigas. Paula? Thanks, John. Mitchell highlighted the whole government approach being applied. So I'm just going to kind of keep that theme going. And I want to share with you how we're partnering to safely integrate AAM into the national airspace system, but mostly from a research and testing perspective. Um, so we know the FAA has a long and successful history of safely introducing new technologies and emerging operations into the NAS. Um, we do this by collaborating with other government agencies, such as NASA and the DOD, and we leverage each other's unique expertise and capabilities. Together, we're evaluating these emerging technologies and operations, and we're employing modeling, simulation, and flight testing. Uh, Mitchell mentioned, and we're really excited with our new partnership with the United States Air Force AFWORK Prime Division. So in October, we entered and signed a memorandum of understanding with this organization. And the whole purpose is to really share data which will support FAA's efforts to safely accelerate the integration of AAM into the NAS and the United States Air Force AFWORK Prime efforts to advance the maturity and integration of AAM 
also looking into EV tall and autonomous systems. So our partnership with AFWorks, as defined and codified in the MOU, really capitalizes on the flight testing activities underway and planned. And the sole purpose is to share data, to share data in support of what Mitchell mentioned, the initial entry into service objectives, and also future phases as defined in our FAA UAM CONOPS, as well as the implementation plan. Simply put, the partnership is really all about identifying opportunities to collect and share data. So with that said, part of the joint research and testing effort, we, the FAA, have identified specific performance data for collection, which aligns to the needs of the I-teams. And we did this across six specific areas, which include air traffic control and airspace management, vertiports, weight categorization, energy management, environment and noise, and aircraft performance. This data-driven approach really is the basis to inform regulations, policy standards, and NAS airspace integration considerations required for safe AAM operations. We're excited by this collaborative partnership and by promoting a collaborative environment for research and testing. Together, we can examine technical and operational challenge with, of course, applying the necessary scientific rigor to effectively evaluate them. So that concludes my remarks, and I'll hand it over to Ryan to start and queue up the Q&A. Ryan. Perfect. Well, thank you, everyone, for your updates. It's exciting to see the many initiatives we are undertaking and the relationships we're fostering to support the aviation industry. As Paula mentioned, we now have some time for our speakers to answer questions about today's topics. If you would like to ask a question, please use the YouTube live chat function, and we'll go ahead and get started. So. First question is, do we have a release date for the powered lift rule? John, I believe this would probably be fall under your purview. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. Uh, right now, uh, as I said a little bit earlier, we're, we're going through the system right now to, to go through all the comments and then work with our legal teams over here in the FAA and flying standards. Um, we're anticipating a, a fall of 2024 uh, release date on that rule. So I'm sure they'll be here before we know it. It comes thank quickly. <laughs> Thanks, John. Our next question, um, Paul, I think this might be for you. How is the FAA ensuring that their data needs are captured as part of the joint flight testing? So we establish an FAA test team for AAM, and that test team is actively participating as part of the joint test planning working group with AFWorks and NASA. And we're basically helping to shape flight, helping to shape the flight testing being planned and designed. This includes providing our needs and requirements to the various test objectives being defined. And we're also mapping the data needs for collection that I mentioned across those six areas to the test events. And in doing that, we also are considering how do we collect, access, and disseminate this data. So a key initiative as part of the joint test working group is to really develop a comprehensive data management plan for, pro for the process of collecting, protecting that data, accessing it, and making sure we all are able to uh, receive the data that we need for our purposes. Makes sense. Thanks, Paula. Our next question is, aside from working with AAM aircraft manufacturers and operators towards certification of their aircraft, what else is the FAA doing to support the integration of AAM into the NAS? Mitchell, I feel like this one probably is best for you. Yeah, sure. Happy to take it. Thanks, Ryan. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, it's it's really how we work with all the stakeholders right now. So working closely with industry, um, trying to get to yes safely. Um, and and we're, doing that, we're doing that through, you know, an Innovate 28 type site. So, um, you know, by 2028, like I mentioned earlier, expecting uh, to be at scale, um, at least somewhat scale and working with multiple operators potentially. And then also, you know, working through uh, the, ind the individual uh, initial um, ent entry into service sites as we're calling them our building blocks. Um, so I think that's it. I mean, it starts with it starts with the communication and collaboration with all the stakeholders kind of going through that implementation plan um, for each individual implementation and tailoring it from site to site, making sure it's a repeatable process and 
uh, learning as we go and updating the plan. Paul mentioned earlier that it's a living document um, and we're going to make sure, you know, after the first implementation, take lessons learned. Um, how did we, you know, what, what did we do that worked well? What, what might be improved? Um, and then, you know, just integrating from air and ground side, um, took, taking a look at environmental uh, aspects. So, um, you know, I mentioned that these aircraft might be quieter than uh, some, some of the other operations existing today. Um, so what are those environmental aspects? Uh, and how do we do this in scale in a sustainable manner? You know, and, and, and also I'd say a big piece is making sure we hear from uh, local communities throughout. So uh, we want this to, to work for everybody. Understood. Yeah, lots to consider. Thanks, Mitchell. Our, our next question reads, how will these new aircraft be operated within U.S. airspace? So whenever I think airspace, John, I think that's that's a perfect question for you. Well, thank you, Ryan. Appreciate it. Well, as Mitchell had talked about earlier, uh, initial operations for our power lift aircraft, advanced air mobility, would be uh, operated VFR piloted type operations. These initial operations will be done just as our air operator, air taxi organizations operate today. Um, if you're familiar with our part 135 air operator certificates, we anticipate that the aircraft will be operated under 135, just like um, just like we are, our air taxis are today. And, and I think it's important to note that that's why you hear the term a lot of the integration of advanced air mobility. Um, the regulatory framework that we have currently absolutely supports what we're trying to do with power lift and advanced air mobility, which is a few modifications. Um, the, the integration of these aircraft into our Part 135 existing structure, uh, I think works perfectly. Understood. Well, thanks, John, and thanks for these submitted questions. We'll go ahead and, and continue with our Q&A. And Russ asked, will designated takeoff and landing sites be specified on sectional charts or locations be distributed via NOTAMs based on activity volume? Want me to take that one? Sure, yeah. All right, uh, really good question. Uh, and it's one of those questions that we're still working on some of that, right? We, we know that the initial operations, just like I was talking about earlier, will be under part 135 air taxi operations, uh, just as heliports today uh, are also located in those NOTAMs and on the charts that you're talking about. Uh, helicopter, heliport operations will look very similar with these vertiports that we're looking to put into place. So stand by. I don't, I don't want to sit here and say absolutely that A will lead to B, um, but to follow the template of what we have currently in our operations, it's likely that yes, they will. Understood. Makes sense. Thanks, Russ, for your question, and thanks, John, for your response. Moving forward, Justin asked, how will members of the public who do not work in aviation industry be made aware that these additional aviation impacts are coming near term as part of integrated teams community engagement strategy? Yeah, so I, I think that's a great question because, you know, I've already mentioned community engagement a couple of times. So, you know, I think it's going to be uh, similar to the way we do airspace changes today. So um, there are community roundtables for local communities to understand, you know, changes that might be coming down, um, you know, in the future. So I think, you know, we're going to leverage the process that's been working well already. Um, you know, I think uh Taking advantage of that is is going to be huge to making sure everybody understands what's coming. Yeah, it makes sense. Thanks, Justin, for your question and your response, Mitchell. Our next question comes from Dylan, and Dylan asks, for a young professional and graduate student like me, how can someone like me get involved in conducting research and studies on these needed key activities and procedures? Yeah, I, I, I'll take that one, too. And um, I think, you know, there's always going to be exciting opportunities out there, especially in a, a growing industry like this. So I'd say, you know, usajobs.gov uh, is a good one where we're going to have, um, you know, a lot of uh, opportunities all across the FAA to get involved here. So, um, you know, take a take a look there. Yeah, makes sense. Definitely a good resource. Thanks, Mitchell. And thanks, Dylan, for, for your interest in your question. Our next question comes from Mark, and Mark asks, "Is what is an autonomous operation uh, in advanced air mobility?" Yeah, I think um, you, you'll definitely enjoy the January webinar that's going to be all about autonomy. But um, I guess to, to answer and give a little bit of a spoiler alert to, to talk about that a little bit, this is um, I think this is where, where we're all, try all trying to get to right now. So the presentation today was primarily about initial operations and, you know, we're expecting that to be all, all piloted um, and, you know, look like 
uh, conventional operations in many ways today. But, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, operators and manufacturers of the aircraft are um, trying to develop autonomous capabilities as well. So that means, um, you know, pilotless operations. Um, so we're, we obviously have a, a ton of work to do there. Um, and, you know, maybe John can talk a little bit about, you know, the, the process that it'll take to, um, you know, certify such a thing. But, um, you know, we're, we're going to be making sure that the a system is in place and obviously a safety process is in place as well. But hopefully that answers at least what what is autonomy um it's you know aircraft operating without a pilot um and obviously safely thanks mitchell yeah and thanks and, and, and if, yeah, I was gonna add, if i was going to add anything onto that um you know absolutely and, and mitchell you're spot on with everything there and it's uh you know what is autonomy and often in, uh, we've heard situations where remote piloted systems are sometimes confused a little bit with autonomy but mitchell's absolutely correct we're, we're talking about systems that don't have a pilot either in the aircraft or being remotely controlled by a pilot on the ground so um, a lot of the data gathering exercises that we do and we're still doing right now are in support of answering those questions. It, it was an excellent question. Uh, it seems simple, but but it's actually very detailed. And it's one of the reasons why we're, we're utilizing the SVAR processes to, as we, we bring VFR piloted operations into the system, in the background, we're constantly uh, trying to evolve that uh, into what remotely piloted and then autonomous operations are gonna look like. Uh, what, what else do we need to do? What other changes to the NAS do we need to do? Are there other rules or regulations that we need to do? What, what does the, the training uh, for flight crews look like as we move through that process and through that system? So it's an excellent question, and it's it, it, uh, it it's a really going to be a very exciting time as we kind of watch this evolution uh, to aviation moving forward. Couldn't agree more. And thanks, Mark, for your question and for being one step ahead. You know, always you know we we hope you can join us for our next webinar, like Mitchell mentioned, that's specifically on autonomy, and we hope you can bring that same enthusiasm to next next month's event. Our next question is from Brent, and Brent asks. Can the SFAR process be used to address other key Innovate 28 challenges? So, Paul, I'm not sure if that one is for you or John, actually, probably more probably your speed, right? Yeah, yeah, I can take that. Uh, the SFAR process is, is available throughout the, the Federal Aviation Administration, right? It, not just power lift. It's not, you know, uh, dedicated to just what we're dealing with right now with advanced air mobility. Um, at the moment, we have not identified any, any other areas where we're thinking that an SFAR may be required. This particular SFAR is pretty wide ranging. And if any of you had the opportunity to, to see the SFAR when it was released back in June, you'll see that it's extremely comprehensive. So we're not anticipating that we'll have to release another SFAR. Our intent it is to move from the SFAR to permanent rulemaking as we move through this uh, data gathering process over the next few years. Understood. Thanks, Brett, for your question and John for your response. Uh, our next question comes from Matt. And Matt asks, for the cybersecurity requirements, will advanced air mobility have their set or will they leverage others like AC-119 or DO-3355? Yeah, I, I'm, so I'm not an expert on cybersecurity to, to quote those orders for you, but I, I can say that, you know, that's a, a huge topic of conversation at the interagency working group. So we have um, you know, not just our experts in uh, security from the FAA, but also uh, TSA and DHS there as well, and, and, and other agencies too. So um, cybersecurity is a big piece. I, I think, you know, in general, um, you know, we're we're trying to make sure that we take a look and start with what we have today, right, uh, and, and just use new research to fill in the gaps. Makes sense. Thanks, Matt, for your question, and, and Mitchell, for your response. Our, our next question comes from Stephen and Stephen asks, will the FAA only work with agencies and large heavily funded? Sorry, the question disappeared. Um, we got moved to a different list. All right, I'll have to circle back to that one. Uh, William asked, what does the pilot certification process look like? Will eVTOL be considered a new category or class? I'll take that one. Um, the power lift SVAR that we've been talking about here actually addresses that. Uh, there will be a new category of, of powered lift uh, that's going to be uh, categorized by the uh, rule once we release the rule in final. That allows any fixed wing pilot or rotorcraft pilot to then obtain that category rating. Uh, then each aircraft that we're working with right now for their type certifications will be type rated. 
So, uh, you know, we're, we're all familiar with uh, the Archers and Jobies and Supernals that we see out there right now. Each one of those aircrafts, as they come into the system, will be type rated by the Aircraft Evaluation Division that we have here in Flight Standards, uh, and, and the pilots will be certificated through that manner. Understood. Thanks, John. Thanks for the submitted question. And our next comes from Jonas. And Jonas asks, it was mentioned that performance testing is essential for proposing regulatory policies for EV tolls. Do you consider the existing aviation regulations and performance evaluations to set new regulations? You want to take that one, Paul, or you want me to? I, I, probably John should take take that one. We're we're going to you know with, through our efforts with the joint flight testing activities and the the data collection initiative that we have underway. It's really our objective to provide each of the FAA organizations the data set that they need um, to really, you know, make sure that you have what you need, John, right, for, no, it, for it, your it, policy that, it, standards and, and regulations. So I'll, I'm going to, you know, that aircraft performance data is really key. And Correct. a lot of what we see in terms of the needs of the I teams, uh, there's some commonality across those six uh, areas that I mentioned in terms of what they're looking for in terms of you know, the data that they're requesting. No, I agree 100%, Paul. And it, it, the, for the question, it's almost, a, yes, it's a little bit of all the above. Um, and, and one of the things that we do in these situations where we have something this new coming into our system, and one of the advantages of, of using a, a, you know, an SVAR, quite frankly, around a special class that we have, is we're able to pull in various components out of already approved parts out of our part 23, 25, 27, 29, and then author new pieces of performance-based regulations within that SVAR. So uh, the question was well-written, and, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, it's a little bit to, to um, it's not a cop-out to say yes, all the above, uh, but it's yes, it's all the above, uh, because we, we have that flexibility to be able to bring all of those elements in and not just lock ourselves in one corner of a rulemaking activity. Understood. Thanks for those responses, Paul and John, and and thank you, Jonas, for your submitted question. I don't believe there are any more questions in the the queue. So while we still have our our panelists on the call, if you have any questions, please please feel free to submit those while we still have a few minutes of time. Um, but John Mitchell, Paul Paul Fontaine, as well, is there anything else we'd like to add uh, before we wrap up today's presentation? All right. Well, I think hey, in that case. Hey, uh, uh, Ryan, there is one thing I would like to circle back on. Right. And that was the questions that we received around uh, community engagement, right? So as we as we move forward here, right, um, as we keep saying all hands on deck on the FAA side, that, that topic really is all hands on deck across the industry and, and the government, right, together um, as we work to, to try and address that, right? So um, we really have, to, as we communicate, as people start to become more familiar with these um, entering into the airspace, um, all parties kind of have a role and responsibility, right, to kind of educate on, on what they are, how they behave, how they're performing, how they'll be used. Um, so we really look forward to a, an overall collaboration, right, between government and industry to help solve, um, you know, and answer those kind of questions. So. Um, it's not just a government only responsibility. Um, there's a lot of uh, you know people that have to participate as part of that process. and And I always describe this as a learning experience, right? I think uh, the learning to be done here is that it is a new class of aircraft. It's going to look and perform differently, and it's going to be a lot quieter than what we've experienced in the past. So uh, but that said, there still will be questions, right that the that the public will have. Um, as these uh, are employed, and uh, we're we're, we're going to have to work those issues together. Understood. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate your your comments on that. And with that said, we're going to go ahead and wrap up today's webinar. So thank you again to to Paul Mitchell, John, and Paula uh, for for joining us today. And thank you to everyone in the audience who joined us for today's update. We hope you join us next month when we partner with the Association for Uncrewed Vehicle Systems International for a webinar panel discussion on autonomy on January 31st, starting at 3 p.m. Eastern time. In the meantime, please visit our webpage at faa.gov slash air hyphen taxis for the latest updates, including information about future webinars. Thank you all and hope you have a great day. Take care.